It's time to look at the Kubernetes API and how it makes modeling the application lifecycle easier. With a whole universe of things to learn, it's important to start with the essentials. Let's go over the concepts that make Kubernetes usable, scalable, and just downright awesome. Are you ready? Kaslin, when it comes to what scalable applications need, we've talked about containers and nodes, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's plenty more we need in order to run a full scalable application. Exactly. And that's where the Kubernetes API comes in. It offers some really convenient primitives that make managing cloud-native applications a lot easier. We've already talked about a few API objects like pods and nodes, but there's also services, deployments, secrets, and many more. That's a lot. Why don't we start simple and use an example application? We said that containers are the first step using Kubernetes, so let's start with this container I built to run my Hello app. This app is really simple. It just returns hello whenever I ping it on its local IP and port 8080. So what next? Well, the first thing we have to do is to create some machines or nodes to run your application on. Got you. OK, I'll use Google Kubernetes Engine to quickly get started. I can just use the G Cloud command line tool to provision a Kubernetes cluster. After a few minutes, we'll have a cluster that's all ready to go. And by default, it comes with three nodes. This is a great starting point but now we need to actually run my app. So how do we do that? Since we're using the command line, we can use a handy tool called kubectl to help interact with the Kubernetes API. Don't worry, we'll go into kubectl in more detail later, but we're keeping it simple, remember? What about all these other tools I've heard of? Uh, kube control, kube cuddle, kube ectl? There are a lot of different ways to pronounce the name of this tool. So whatever works for you. Anyway, this command is actually going to create a Kubernetes API object called a deployment. A deployment is an abstraction that manages the lifecycle of an application. I can set the desired number of app instances for the deployment to manage, and then it will make sure the correct number of instances or replicas are running. Exactly. So if we increase the number of replicas that we want, the deployment will see that there's currently not enough replicas and spin up another one. That even works when a node crashes. If the node goes down, the current state is once again different from the desired state. And Kubernetes will schedule another replica for us. Awesome. Now I know my app is running on these nodes. How do I access it? For that, we'll have to create a service. This creates an endpoint that we can use to access the running app instances. In this case, we have multiple app instances. So this service will load balance incoming requests between the two running pods. That's right. For any container inside of the cluster, they can connect to my service using the service's name. Either way, the service keeps track of wherever the pod is running. That's another example of how Kubernetes removes the need to manually keep track of where your containers are running. Even if a pod were to go down, once a new one comes back online, the service will automatically update its list of endpoints to target the new pod. So Kubernetes objects like deployments and services automatically ensure that we have the right number of app instances running through pods and that we can always reach them. This seems like it would allow for some really cool features. Yes, features that used to have to be manually coded just become afterthoughts when using Kubernetes. For example, deployments make things like rolling updates really simple. Whoa, you're saying that we can edit the deployment and watch the version of the applications gradually change? So let's say we have three replicas. And, and I want to put out a new version of my application that returns bye instead of hello. You're saying I can update my application container, watch as the new version is gradually rolled out, and the deployment will bring up new application instances and start rerouting traffic to them? Then once the desired number of new instances are online, the old application instances are taken offline? This would mean this approach has zero downtime since Kubernetes is incrementally updating old pod instances with new ones. Exactly right. And a feature like that, plus the ability to quickly roll back if necessary, and keeping track of deployment histories and more, all of that is just built into Kubernetes. That's a large part of what makes it such a great tool to build other systems and applications on top of. The Kubernetes API really does make it easy to manage the application lifecycle. Uh, the basic primitives, pods, service, deployments, plus a few more we'll talk about soon, allow sysadmins and developers to focus on the app without having to worry about managing it at scale. But one thing I noticed is that we used an imperative approach. We made manual commands. Instead of using a declarative approach, 
which is one of the big appeals of Kubernetes. Great catch. Next episode, let's dig into that. We'll use Kubernetes the way it was intended to be used, by updating config files. Starting with an example monolith, we'll break it up into a microservices style architecture. This will also let us introduce some of the other core primitives that we didn't talk about, like labels and secrets. We're gonna pair code up a microservice version of this? Hmm. Okay, stay tuned everybody. Next time, we'll be exploring building a basic Kubernetes app from scratch. In the meantime, if you wanna get hands-on, check out the link in the description. And if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe for more.